Thank you, and morning, everyone. Welcome this morning, Bethany. Glad that you can be with me, um, and that we can be together here in an ongoing series that we do every September around the themes of what we do here at Bethany that helps us fulfill our mission statement. And so we have this kind of trifecta of gather, grow, and go. Last week, Eric spoke on the theme of gathering and the importance of you know, reincarnating the presence of Christ by coming back into the building in a post-COVID world. Very, very significant and important. This morning, we're looking at the theme of grow. Uh, we're drawing on the Psalms for this series, and I'm going to be speaking out of Psalm 1. So please pray with me, and then we'll begin. Father, thanks that we can gather here, and now we want to commit these moments to you and invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Give us ears to hear what your Spirit has to say to us, our desire, Father, is to be shaped by, to be formed by you, in order that we might be in increasing measure people of hope in the midst of a world that is angry, cynical, despairing, and afraid. Shape us, Father, for your purposes, even in these moments. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm going to begin this morning by taking you to my bulletin. And your bulletin, my bulletin. I uh, take you to the bulletin and my, the outline here. Because what I do every, every week when I'm preaching is I prepare an outline and I send it into the office and I never proofread it. And this, year, this time, this week, uh, it had some negative consequences. So if you read the first sentence, Paul's great passion was that everyone have a perfectly aligned understanding of the doctrines of the faith. There's a slide, I want to make a slight change. It should read this. Paul's great passion was not that everyone have a perfectly aligned understanding of the doctrines of the faith. It's a subtle change, but I think you might pick up on it and see that this, it takes us in a different direction, right? And, and so then I go on to say doctrines matter, but they aren't the most important thing. Christ made visible is the most important thing. And this is based on Galatians 4.19, where the Apostle Paul says that I, Paul, in writing to the Galatians, he says, I'm like a mother in child labor pains. I'm in birth pains. So strong is my desire that Christ be formed in you. In other words, in Paul's brain, the bottom line is not your capacity to defend inerrancy or to have this kind of bomb-proof view of the atonement that you can defend or the historicity of the virgin birth or the resurrection or the you know, archaeological authenticity of the manuscripts, all this stuff that we kind of spent a lot of time debating over, dividing over even. Paul says the bottom line is... You look like Jesus. And Paul, even in Galatians, defines that. Is there flowing through you love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness? Is there justice flowing through you? Is there a capacity for mercy? That's what this is all about. That's why we do this baptism stuff. That's why we sing these songs. That's why we gather us in the teaching. It's why I will today encourage you to move beyond Sundays into habits for the week that can help you be formed to become a person of hope in a world desperate for what you have to give. So um, if Christ is visible is the most important thing, Psalm 1 is going to give us three practices that will put us on the path of formation. Uh, number one, avoid the false narrative. Uh, number two, uh, also uh, significantly develop delight in, in the rhythm of revelation and response. And number three, embrace slow. So I want to look at all of those. Uh, together in our time together, we begin with the first one, avoid the false narrative. And the false narrative in Psalm 1, very interesting, is a triple negative. So this psalm starts off, you know, like very, uh, almost confrontive. And, and the psalmist says, don't do this. Like, it's not very hopeful in a way. I like to start with a joke or a word of hope or, you know, something. And this guy, here's his start. You're blessed if you don't do these three things, right? But that makes me stand up and take notice. These three things are very important. And what are the things we're not to do? Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't stand in the path of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of scoffers. So I want to kind of sweep away a couple of common misunderstandings of these texts. What we're talking about here, first practice, avoid the false narrative. And one way this text is read is, and I kind of heard this growing up in my very, very conservative church, common misunderstanding is this. Hey, there's bad people out there. They're different than the good people, and you'll be able to identify the bad people. 
by where they spend their time, what they wear maybe, who they voted for in the election. And in one version, the bad people are in bars, cheap motels on Aurora, or they're living in tents near the stadium or something like that. They might be in the country illegally. Stay away from those people. They're only trouble. It creates kind of a fear in our culture. But then in another version of this same narrative, the bad people are in the universities, uh, the professors. They're, they're in the media. They're, they're in tech companies. They're trying to systematically take God out of schools and out of all public life. They're trying to destroy the country, remove God from the public sphere. And here's the message. Avoid these people, right? Boom. Stay away. They're bad. Well, here's the problem. Jesus didn't avoid these people. And if, the, if you're trying to be shaped to look like Jesus, um, in fact, one of the main complaints regarding Jesus is he's hanging out with those people, right? Here's the question that was asked of Jesus. Why is he hanging out with the tax gatherers and the sinners and the prostitutes and the Republicans and the Democrats and the university professors and the seminary professors? Like, come on, why is he doing that? We're the good guys over here. He should be spending time with us. So that's the first problem with that interpretation. But then there's another kind of misunderstanding and misreading of this text, which is this. Hey, this text isn't even valid because if you listen to Jesus, when someone came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus say? There's no one good. Well, there's no one good and I'm not supposed to hang out with bad people then everyone's bad. And if everyone's bad, then I can't hang out with you, right? And so then, like, I'm forced to deconstruct that text into kind of meaninglessness. So I'm going to offer a third way here, which says this. Look, we live in a world saturated with lies, and there's truth available as well. And what the author is saying here is you need to live a life of discernment and flee from the lies and stand firmly in the truth. And ultimately, that's what spiritual maturity is. In Hebrews 6, we're told that those who are spiritually mature are able to discern good from evil. So we're, we're fleeing from, we're identifying lies, fleeing from them, standing in truth, right? And, and so that's what we want to do. And so <clears throat> toward that end, let me make two observations about lies. First observation. There's an abundance of lies in our culture. I mean, it's just a, there's an abundance of lies. They're, they're everywhere, right? And you can see lies by how people finish the sentence. I am, and then you finish the sentence, with what's most important to you, right? I am my uh, skiing. I, I am my retirement. I, I am my net worth. I am my education. I am my, re my religious affiliation. I am my political affiliation. I am my ethnic heritage. I am my sexual identity. I am my university degree. I am the business I built. I am my family. I am my lifestyle. I am my travel. I am my geography of residence. And we never say these things consciously, but if you look at your credit card and your outlook, like that's a revelation of where you spend your time and your money building an identity so that you can say, I, my life has meaning. And look, here's, here's how I know it. Look at what I've done. I've traveled the world, or I have the best marriage, or I have the coolest kids, or I preach to the most people. Whatever it is, we build identities on, like, all of those are lies, as I'll share in a minute. And then, in addition to that, we live in a culture continually seeking to make all of us insecure in our identity and then offering a solution to a fabricated insecurity I encourage you to buy a product. That's called advertising, right? And so every day, depending on how much time you spend online, four to 10,000 advertisements kind of come across your purview, you know, television, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, on and on, you know, radio, everything. It's, every, it's everywhere. Advertise everywhere. So now, I, like, I'm made to feel inadequate in some way and here are advertisements saying, buy me, taste me, touch me, invest in me, visit me, be like me, consume me. And in every case, what's being offered is a more fulfilling identity. So you'll be cooler if you do this thing, if you drive this car or whatever. Now, I used to mock advertising just 
unilaterally and be like this. What a waste of money that, you know, Cadillac hires Matthew McConaughey to sit in a car and pontificate on the meaning of life. Who's going to buy a Cadillac just because Matt McConaughey is doing that? I don't care, right? I just want to give him A to B, so forget it. And then I'm kind of mocking Cadillac, and I'm, I've been watching tennis, and I'm mocking Nike. Why do they spend this money? And I remember an event that happened to me years ago, a, a few years ago. I have kind of this hero in the mountaineering world. His name is Killian Jornet, or Jornet, depending on how you pronounce. And he's a mountain skier and runner, and he goes really fast through the mountains. And so, you know, I watch his YouTube videos. He has a YouTube channel. I'm watching his stuff. And I come to discover he's sponsored by Solomon. And he had a super inspired, uh, inspiring video about a thing he did. And I noted his approach shoes, his running shoes. And I, so then I went online and looked up those shoes. I was like, I got to get those shoes. Because I want to, like, this guy is amazing. I want to run like this guy. So, da -da, you know, Amazon, da -da -da, three days later because we live in the mountains, there's no half-hour delivery where we live. <laughs> here's shoes. Woo, okay. Over and over. Now, here's a backstory. In the moment, my running world consists of like three miles twice a week. 18-minute mile, right? Super slow. You could walk faster. Uphill, so that's why it's slow. A little bit why. But other, the real reason is I'm slow. So anyway, so, so I'm like, get the shoes. Then, foolishly, I go, now that I have the shoes, I'm running seven miles today. So, you know, I hike up to this uh, place above our house, and then I run all the way home, a seven-mile run. Right around mile six, I have what's called in the runner's world a calf heart attack. I hear this pop in my calf, and, and then I'm kind of limping, you know, home the rest of the way, and I'm thinking the whole time, what went wrong? Like, I have the shoes. Like, subtly... The shoes should have given me like a new identity. And that's, a, like, that's an extreme illustration, but advertising exists to create a sense of inadequacy regarding your identity and offer your product to offer the solution to the fabricated problem. And we need to like, kind of identify that. And what David is simply saying here is don't believe the lies. And uh, Jesus says the same thing, John 8, 32. He says, if you abide in my word, my word abides in you, you'll know the truth. The truth will what? set you free, right? So I want to be free from like all the pressure to, uh, of false narratives to create a new identity. I am not my running skill. You are not your parenting skill. You are not your net worth. You are not your body mass index. You are not your SAT scores. You are not your GPA. You are not the neighborhood you live in. You are not the city you live in. You are not your real estate status, whether you rent or buy or are uh, unhoused. You are not how you brew your coffee, as astonishing as that may sound. You are not that, right? You are not your music taste. You are not your circumstances. There are people who have been married and are married no more. There are people who have this job and they have it no more. There are people who were healthy and then went to the doctor, did a blood test, the test came back positive. Circumstances dramatically changing. People's houses were burned down. You are not your circumstances. You are not any of those things. Don't dwell in that world. Don't be defined by false narratives that create a sense of perpetual dissatisfaction so you spend the rest of your days trying to build the brand that is you. That's a lie. You're not any of that. Here's what you are. You are complete in Christ. You are called. You are forgiven. You are adopted. You are loved. You are gifted. And no one can ever take any of that away from you. Amen? Like we stand there. We start there. We live there. We finish there, and if we do, hello, we thrive. There's lots of lies, but let's identify them and sweep them aside. Second, observation, under point one, the lies, the lies are subtle. In Isaiah 5, it says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What does this mean? This means that lies can come to us through people carrying great big Bibles, right? So just, just the fact that we're gathered here and, and that we can recite the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed doesn't inherently imply that all that you hear within these walls from me or anyone is always 
True, it'd be very discerning, each of us, and collectively discerning, so that we don't get swept away into a river of lies. And so this text in Isaiah is saying there will be times when it's incredibly difficult to discern between good and evil. I was just in a conversation this week with someone who in his faith community is under tremendous distress because in his community, it is seen as a great thing that Russia is invading Ukraine because the invasion of Ukraine means that wars and rumors of wars are increasing. Therefore, the return of Christ must hence be very close. And so the worse things get, the happier we are in this, in this narrative. Same thing with uh, global warming. Oh, forest fires in California, forest fires in Australia, epic thousand-year heat wave in Europe. You know, bring it on. Just means Jesus is coming back. Listen, the people who are happy about Russia invading Ukraine are not in Ukraine. And the people happy about forest fires in California are not in California. <laughs> and the people happy about droughts so that the water now in the Central Valley where I grew up is so salinated that, it, that crop yields are diminishing. The farmers are not happy. The Ukrainians are not happy. The mountain dwellers are not happy. It's people kind of living in comfort somewhere, taking a weird dispensational theology and turning it into the worse things get, the better we feel. No, that's a lie. C.S. Lewis said the greatest evils are not now done in those sordid dens of crime that Dickens wrote about. They're not even done in concentration camps and labor camps. In those, we see evil's final result, but evil is conceived and ordered and moved and seconded and carried and minuted in clean, carpeted, warmed, well-lit offices by quiet men with white collars, cut fingernails, smooth-shaven cheeks who don't even need to raise their voice. In other words, we live in a world of systemic evil, and it's vital to identify that, name it, and move away from it, because the text says we will never be blessed if we're defined by systemic evil, if we're defined by the lies of our culture. We have to run from those things. And we were wealthy and Christian. We especially need to be very careful, because we tend to elevate people who have the right words about the deity of Christ and the authenticity of the Bible and the meaning of Christ's death on the cross, and then we believe everything they say, but history tells us that you can say all the right things doctrinally and still in your display of actual living be, you know, horrifically destructive. Isaiah 29, 13 is the complaint of the prophet who says this, these people honor me with their lips, right words, but their hearts are far from me. So, you know, these people honor me with their lips and use the Bible to justify slavery. 19th century America. These people honor me with their lips, but use their Bible to justify the subjugation of women and witch hunts. Uh, medieval Europe. These people honor me with their lips, but use the Bible to justify anti-Semitism, illiteracy, colonialism, militarism, consumerism, nationalism, capitalism, communism, crusades, religious wars, and a hundred other sins that are responsible for mass suffering, disease, and death across the planet for 2,000 years, in Jesus' name. Some missionaries of a new generation were in Africa, and uh, they met with a cold reception, and they ended up meeting with a group of pastors, and they said, well, how come you guys don't trust us? And he said, because your predecessors came, and they said, uh, close your eyes and pray with us, and while we closed our eyes, you stole our land. So no. Uh, it's going to take a while to trust you in Jesus' name. Now, I want to note here that the work that we're doing in Costa Rica and Nicaragua and Rwanda at Bethany is not this stuff. It's incredible. Just to give you one example, in, in Nicaragua, we're empowering rather than dominating. So the people are being empowered to buy their own land, learn uh, productive to market agriculture, pay off the loan that is given them so that they can own their land. And then when they own their land, the, the woman in the household, the wife, it's required that she's on the title, which is unheard of in this particular Central American culture. Empowering women, empowering agriculture, empowering ownership in Jesus' name. That's the goal. 
But let's just name it. It hasn't always happened that way. And the beauty of this psalm, if there's hope in this first section, it's this. Uh, the wicked are like chaff which the wind drives away. You know, I'm just going to say it this way. Uh, nothing that is done in these wicked ways, none of these lies, and none of the cultures built on lies or the, or the initiatives stemming from lies, none of it is sustainable. Just look at history. Egyptian Empire, domination, gone. Babylonian Empire, gone. Assyrian Empire, gone. Persian Empire, gone. Greek Empire, gone. Roman Empire, gone. French Revolution, Russian Revolution, rise and fall of the Reich in Germany. Attempted tribal revolution in Rwanda with genocide. The point God is making in Psalm 1 is this. Nothing built on domination and oppression ever lasts, ever. That's really good news. It's, just gonna, it's eventually going to be exposed and then kind of collapse as a house of cards. And by the way, it doesn't just happen to empires, it happens to churches. And there are kind of mega churches and church movements and superstar pastors. And my entire lifetime, from the 80s when I began in ministry, it's been a kind of a, just a runway of big works rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. Sexual scandal, financial scandal, political scandal, over and over, leadership scandal. No. <laughs> but yes, it's good that such works don't last. So, you know, we want to identify where there's lies. We want to identify false identities in our own being. And we want to not identify with those and move away from them. And so then the question is, well, how do we do that? And we have to do that by embracing the positive, which is kind of the second habit here, develop uh, delight in the rhythm of revelation and response. In other words, verse 2 says that the one who is not uh, walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the uh, path of sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers, the one who isn't doing that is doing this. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And I'm going to take that word law here and kind of broaden it a little bit uh, to use the word uh, instruction from the Lord so that we understand together here in this room, interpreting the Old Testament through the lens of the new, that the law of the Lord includes the Bible, but is more than the Bible. In other words, God is revealing, we know from the Bible, God is revealing God's character to you through many sources. The Bible and Jesus become your reference point, so you're not swept away in weird stuff. But with that as a reference point, right, creation is revelation. Community is revelation. Uh, challenges are, are revelation. So we kind of have this, these C's that we look at, you know, creation, community challenges that become for us other means of revelation. Culture is another C, means of revelation. So here's what the text is saying. When we're saturated, meditating on revelation from God, beginning with Scripture, then what happens is in our meditation, it's like our soul is transformed. God gives us now a lens to which we look at everything, and now everything becomes instructive. Does that make sense? So like there's this kind of exponential growth in my capacity for transformation because meditation <clears throat> has over the whole world to me as another day in school, God's school. So for example, as I'm writing exactly this point on my little Pandora playlist, up comes some piano music by this woman named Liz Story. And I knew the music by her phrasing because I play piano. And immediately I'm ushered back to 1986 and the birth of my son. Because my wife and I lived in Friday Harbor. And um, so when, a, when Donna goes into labor at about, you know, 8 p.m. or so, uh, we call our doctor, who fortunately owns a plane, because he won't deliver, no, no babies delivered on the island. And so we got in a little plane, you know, fly to Anacortes. Hospital has a little van. We hop in. We go. Donna delivers super quickly. So, you know, we meet the doctor just about 10 p.m. And my son Noah was born at midnight. <laughs> so, you know, fly. Ah, boom. Born. That's how it worked. A little more complex, right? But you get it. So then, you know, I spent the night in the hospital, and then the next morning, I walked downtown. To, uh, it's a downtown Anacortes, and uh, to like buy a donut or something. And I went into a record store, albums, and bought Liz Story's 
like piano music, and then played it all through my son's first two weeks of life in his infancy. I'd sit at the piano and play along and hold him in one arm. And now when I hear her, I think of him. And I say a prayer. God, thank you for my son. And the way you've watched over him for like 35 years. And now the way he's a husband and the way he's a dad and the way he's faithful and the way he seeks wisdom and his compassionate heart. It's beautiful. So there's a little moment of revelation from, from culture. Same thing happens in creation. I'm out, you know, hiking. Same thing happens in challenges. Traffic from 85th to downtown used to be just a moment of hatred for me. Like I, I would be stuck and I'd be like this. Who are all these people? It's two in the afternoon. Does no one have normal work that they have? To, they're in an office still? How come every, how is everyone on the road at 2 p.m.? And by the way, why are you here? You're in my way. Please leave. And now, through some act of grace, I love those traffic jams almost to the point where I'm sad when there is no traffic. Because when I'm in that traffic, I start praying for this city. And I think back to the first time I showed up in this city in 1976 as a student. From, I'm going to attend Seattle Pacific. I'd never been north of Sacramento. And I drive up past Kent and I see downtown. I go, wow. This is the city. What a gift that it's still the city. You get to pray for it and live in it and serve it. So do you, do you see? Like when, we, when, we, when we're rooted and grounded in Scripture and meditation, suddenly we now have the lens to receive revelation all over the place. And what God is saying is, blessed are those who, who delight in that revelation. And the way this has been misread often is, hey, you better delight in your quiet time or you're never going to thrive. And I want to tell you, no one delights in their quiet time every time. So if that's your paradigm, you're setting yourself up for trouble because you're like this, oh, yeah, 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 you know, you look at Instagram and there's a picture of an open Bible, a candle and a cup of steaming coffee and somebody writing their journal and you're like, that's my goal. And then in your world, you oversleep, you have a meeting, you check your app, there's traffic, you go to your daily reading thing, it's Leviticus, and you're like this, why am I, why am I here? Why is this book here? Why did God write this? And maybe he had a reason, but why is it preserved? And, that, and now I'm feeling like shame that I don't delight. This is not that. This text is not that. This text is saying, look, delight in developing this habit of receiving and responding to God's revelation. Just develop that habit. And by the way, when you develop a habit, ha habits aren't this continual upward trajectory to bliss. No habit is. Habits are a good day, a medium day, a good day, a bad day, maybe two bad days in a row, a terrible day, and then another good day. Just keep showing up, looking for revelation in text, creation, culture, challenges, and community, and you begin to delight in what God is showing you. And when you delight in what God is showing you, you become like a tree planted, watch this, not by a stream, the Bible, but by streams of living water, the Bible, culture, challenges, creation, and community. So you see Christ teaching you everywhere, and it's delightful. And what's delightful is the big picture of this quiet confidence you're being transformed. Any particular day, not necessarily delightful. Like for me, in my marriage, we have a habit, my wife and I, of connecting in the morning. And I will say to you, that connection is not always delightful. What's delightful is 43 years. Does that make sense? 43 years is delightful. Getting old together is delightful. Knowing each other inside and out is delightful. But on a particular day, it's good. On another day, it's annoying. On another day, it's funny. On another day, I'm bored. Okay. Never have I said this. You know, it was boring this morning with the tea coffee thing. And so um, I'll give you two more days. But if this doesn't work, you know, I'm not a fan of boredom. And so I'm going to look for somebody more stimulating. Who does that? Well, people do that. And in an instant culture, we think 
that like we've created this kind of straw man in our minds that, you know, our walk with Jesus is this like eternal bliss thing. No, it's not. It's just like marriage. In fact, it is marriage. You're the bride of Christ. So you show up. And then over time, you find delight in, you know, Canadian geese in the Cascades and bald eagles at Green Lake and, and you know, music, whether it's a better or a triple door, it doesn't matter. God's speaking and you're responding. And then it, when that happens, you're being transformed. And it says, you become like a tree planted by a stream of living water. And then what? You bear fruit, which simply means this. In a world that's filled with fear, anxiety, rage, and cynicism, you become a person of, you know, courage, peace, patience, and hope. That's a pretty good deal. Sign me up. And last thing, very quickly, ironically, very quickly, because the last point is go slow, right? But we're out of time. And all I mean by go slow is uh, if you take seriously developing a meditation practice, digesting scripture, uh, taking a class, root soul body, serving in a ministry here, you take it seriously, understand that your transformation is a slow process. And we know this from 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18, which says this, when I gaze at the glory of God in all these ways, here's the promise. I gaze, that's my responsibility, but the byproduct of my gazing, I'm being transformed from glory. It doesn't say instantly. It says this, from glory to glory to glory to glory, small, imperceptible, nevertheless relentless, becoming more and more and more and more like Christ. That, I mean, that's your call and your privilege. We bought our house where we live now in the mountains uh, 10 years ago. And in the past, in September, uh, in the late afternoon, the sun would shine right up. Some of you have been there. Sh would shine right up the driveway to where that little fire circle is. Shine right up the driveway. I was there last night at 5 p.m. No sun. And, and it was a sunny day, and I'm like this. What happened? Like, it's the same earth. It's the same sun. And now I'm in shade all the time. Then I look at the trees on our property, and they're at least five feet taller than they were 10 years ago. And so they've been growing. But here's my point. I've never seen them grow. Not, I mean, not once. And I literally, I've had several phone calls where people would call me and say, what are you doing? And I'll say, I'm drinking coffee, watching my trees grow. I'm just sitting on my deck doing nothing. Though I'm looking, I don't see it. Don't look for your growth. Trust the process. Look at Christ. He will transform you, and the product will be beyond what you could ask, hope, or even imagine. There are resources next door, classes to take, spirit, soul, body class, all kinds of Bible studies on Thursdays for college, women, men. On my website, spiritsoulbody.org, on the front page now, right now, there's a video on meditation. I encourage you to go there and look up that video and begin a practice of meditation. I'll run a, a live class on meditation uh, later in October. But take a step in the process of formation and enjoy the journey because God is changing you to become a person of hope in the world. Father, speak to us now through your Holy Spirit about steps we can take to take formation seriously in order that we might represent your heart well in these challenging days. Thank you that people are hungry for a different paradigm and hungry for meaning. Shape us to be people who represent your hope. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.